Excuse me, little dog. Mm, hi, guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous October day here. And now, I guess, August. It is Tuesday, August 1st, 2023. Feeling like October. Uh, the sun hasn't even gone down. I'm already in my flannel pajamas, my sweatshirt, and my Uggs on my feet. I have my goose down vest ready to put on when the sun goes down and then get the heater cranked up in my tiny house to survive the single coldest August 1st, hands down, I have ever spent in my entire life. So, uh, <laughs> we will see how the rest of the month goes. So anyway, guys, uh, enough of the weather report from here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Yesterday, I read this uh, excellent uh, piece on Medium.com from this fellow calling himself Indica. And in that essay, Indica referenced uh, this book that he highly recommended. I think he called it Essential Reading by this fellow. I'm pretty sure he is a physicist uh, by the name of Tom Murphy, Dr. Tom Murphy, who I am 99% sure is a physicist, and the name of the book, gonna, all right, little dog, we gotta trade you out. The name of this book, which was actually written as a textbook, as a college textbook uh, in 2022, is titled Energy and Human Ambitions on a Finite Planet, Assessing and Adapting to Planetary Limits. So, uh, Indy Koss spoke very highly of this book, and I have a lot of respect for Indy Koss, and my buddy, um, who I've interviewed here a couple of times on Collapse Chronicles, a professor here in town, <clears throat> Jeremy Jimenez. Jeremy uh, totally loves this guy, Tom Murphy, and I think they might even be collaborating on a project together. And so without reading it, you know, I sent it off to other people uh, just based on those. And then my good buddy, Fat Boy, uh, I sent it to him, and he was completely puzzled why I thought this was great. He basically said, this guy did a whole lot of work to reach a bunch of useless conclusions. So I got a little bit suspicious about the book. And I think what we have here, guys, is, is what we have way too much of, okay, assessing and adapting to planetary limits. I think that Tom Murphy, now I have not read the book. I have read the first two chapters and the last chapter. Uh, and what it appears we have here as we have seen about 200 million times before, is someone doing a great job on the assessing planetary limits, and then, after soberly assessing the planetary limits, then they light up the hopium pipe, and I don't know what they're smoking, what they're sticking in there, talking about how we're going to adapt, how humanity is going to voluntarily adapt to the planetary limits. And he is 
apparently I'd say I have not read the full book, but they just perusing some of it. It sounds like that he is throwing most of his eggs into the solar panel basket that it is solar panels that are going to save the planet. Uh, obviously, uh, Tom Murphy has not read Bright Green Lies. He, he has totally swallowed this unadulterated horseshit Bright Green Lie about solar panels. So anyway, what? I just, uh, so I was going to spend the full rant here on this, but we're just going to jump to the very bottom where he wraps it all up. And so I, you know, I, I love it when somebody pr pretty much, you, you know, just kind of encapsulates the last 350 pages of research into all of these bullet points. So, this is Dr. Tom Murphy summarizing his analysis of planetary uh, limits and then how we are going to adapt to them. So let's start with the analysis. Can we ignore the fact that we are pushing planetary boundaries for the first time ever I would argue that this time really is different. The facts, the facts are inescapable. Fact number one, the world has never before been strained with 8 billion people. And that's really as far, that, 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 that fact is the only one he needed to state. But let's hear some more. Uh, after the all-encompassing fact, fossil fuels bear tremendous responsibility for our recent climb. Next, fossil fuels are a one-time resource, an inheritance that will not continue propelling the future, and nature does not guarantee a superior substitute. Wild spaces on the planet are rapidly diminishing as development spreads and resources are called permanent extinction of species accompanies pollution and habitat loss. Next, Climate change and habitat destruction threaten a mass extinction and environmental disruption whose full consequences are unpredictable. And finally, modern human constructs have, <coughs> have not stood the test of time and are unlikely to do so given that they have not been founded on principles of sustainable harmony within planetary limits. There you go. So, so far, I'm giving, uh, I, I'm giving Tom Murphy uh, an A-plus on his paper. And then, right before he signs off, on page 353 of a 354-page book, we have the flip side where Tom Murphy brings out the hopium pipe in the 11th hour and 59th minute. <clears throat> Take it away, Tom. Contrary to what the tone of this book might suggest, I am a fundamentally optimistic person, which has fueled a lifetime of pursuing tough challenges and succeeding at some of them. Indeed, 
my irrational, uh, my irrational, uh, my irrational hope. Well, at least he knows that uh, his apocaloptimism is completely irrational. It, it, it is not based on a studying of the facts that he just mentioned. So he does admit that his optimism is completely irrational. Is that a textbook like this may help get people thinking proactively about changing the course of humanity. And that spirit of wild-eyed optimism, I leave you with the following upbeat adjacent thoughts about the world into which we may endeavor to gracefully adapt. Okay, so he is assessed from assessed to adapt. Okay. Crisis is opportunity. We have a chance to transform the human relationship with this planet. There you go. Imagine the relief, the relief in shedding an old narrative of growth and faulty ambitions that only seems to be creating increasingly intractable problems. Instead, sidestepping to make a fresh start under a whole new conception of humanity's future. It is liberating. People alive today get to witness and shape what may turn out to be the most pivotal moment in human history as we confront the realities of planetary limits. <clears throat> Committed pursuit of steady state principles could set up rewarding lives for countless generations, plural, Nature is truly amazing, and making nature a larger part of our world could be very rewarding. We, as individuals, are privileged to witness and celebrate the much grander phenomenon of life in this universe. Let's be humble participants and value this role over some misguided, ill-considered, hubristic, and perhaps juvenile attempt at dominance. We have learned so much about how the universe works and have the opportunity for greater insights still if we can find a glide path if we can find a glide path to a long-term, sustainable existence. We have built much of value that bears preservation. Posterity relies on a successful embrace of a new vision. We may yet learn to value nature of ourselves in the enduring benefit of us all. Okay. So anyway, uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to let my old doomer buddy, Michael Campy, we're going to bring in Michael Campy uh, to respond uh, to, uh, to Dr. Thomas Murphy, irrationally hopium-soaked apocaloptimist, uh, because Michael said it better than I can.
This is uh, this is Michael Campy. I don't know whether Michael Campy has read Tom Murphy's book. I don't think he has. And as far as I know, Michael is not a physicist. So uh, what is on Michael Camp's Michael Campy's mind this morning? Thinking about humans adapting to planetary limits from medium.com. Take it away, Brother Michael Campy. Adapt level zero. Yes. If your eyes are open just a little bit, or even if you only open them every now and then, like you're playing peekaboo with a baby, you can't help but notice that things are always a little worse than the last time you looked. Eventually, what is going to happen is you will peek out, and what you will see will be so horrible that you won't even be able to unsee it. This could happen in a number of ways. It might be a phone call from a friend who just lost everything in a fire. It might be something you see on TV or the Internet. It might be something you hear on drive time radio while you're going to work. It will be something that is the stuff of nightmares or dystopian horror stories. It will be something that will stop your heart or reduce you to uncontrollable tears. It will be a watershed moment for you. It will be the moment when you finally realize that despite all our, meaning humanity's cleverness, despite our hubris, despite everything we believe about ourselves, despite our clinging to irrational, haha, <laughs> irrational, that's, you know, that's uh, Tom Murphy's word, not Michael's. Despite our clinging to her, clinging to her, clinging to her, clinging like a saguaro cactus with his arms falling off in the drought, clinging to her hope, it's not going to get better, and we are not going to adapt. Things are slipping pretty fast now. The whole structure is caving in on us, you know, like a saguaro cactus dying of heat stroke and thirst. People all over the world are suffering in awful ways, and for the moment, we can look on from the sidelines, but that's not going to last. There is no fix for off-the-chart ocean temperatures. It doesn't matter how smart we think we are. There is no fix for the planet being hotter than it has been in 120,000 years. Well, I fixed that by moving to the Finger Lakes of New York. So not counting moving to the Finger Lakes of New York or coming to visit me at Bugs in a Jar Farm, there is no fix for the planet being hotter than it has been in 120,000 years. It doesn't matter how adaptable we think we are. There is no fix for the ground literally melting out from beneath your feet. It doesn't matter if you believe something can be done. It just can't. There is no fix for heat so intense that it is killing cactus, an organism supremely adapted to hot weather. We are only staving off the inevitable, but
because we currently have access to air conditioning. But what happens when that stops? And the G20, an intergovernmental forum comprising 19 countries, <laughs> The G20 comprising 19 countries and the European Union. It works to address major issues related to the global economy, such as international financial stability, climate change mitigation, and sustainable development. The people who are supposed to be making decisions just ended one of their little get-togethers without an agreement on climate crises. Imagine that. They couldn't agree. How shocking. I guess maybe we can wait until next year and see if they can agree then. I guess I'm not really shocked because we can't seem to agree on much either, so it's not entirely unbelievable. Summing this all up, adaptation is not possible on any level. Attempting to mitigate the immediate effects on our lives is possible, ah, but ultimately futile. Doing what you can while you can is our only currently viable option. There is only one overarching outcome, and that is we are not going to make it. Psychological interventions have fun while you can. Appreciate the natural world while you can. Get some sleep. You're going to need it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, the non-physicist Michael Campy for cutting through the crap. You know, I can always, uh, with, with, with a couple of minor exceptions, uh, I, I can always depend on uh, my fellow Doomer, Michael Campy, uh, to cut through the crap, as they say, with, uh, with, with, with one exception, which we do not need to dredge up here. But uh, anyway, uh, guys, I'm with Michael Campy. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Physicist, Dr. Physicist Tom Murphy. Your assessment sounds pretty good, but uh, that hopium you're smoking uh, about uh, how we're going to adapt to this and some little kumbaya come together uh, moment ain't gonna happen, Tom. Sorry, brother. I'm with Mikey. Anyway, with that, the sun is starting to go down, the temperature is plunging, and I need to uh, get on my goose down vest before heading into my nice, toasty, warm, tiny house with the heater running on August 1st. I highly suggest you get out there and uh, crank up your heater while you still can. Bye, guys.